Okay. Good morning, Trevor. It's really a, a pleasure to, to have you here to collaborate with us uh, with this interview as, a, as an input for this uh, workshop that Samur is organizing. I would like to introduce you as you has now you are now the director of the UC Post Harvest Technology Center, but you have been for more than 20 years uh, dealing with the food safety as well as food quality of fresh produce. First, most uh, linked to the industry, but since the last 20 years, probably in the University of, of Davis. So we have you like a real expert on, the, on this field, and, and we are interested in making you some questions uh, to have an overview or your opinion about the, the use of uh, reclaimed water as irrigation water. So I'm here with uh, Pedro, so he will start chatting you with the, with the different questions. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much for the yeah, last you know, my... yeah. Okay. So I would like to, to, to I was just going to say, it's, it's really, it's my pleasure to, to be here with you. I apologize that, that I wasn't able to be there uh, on site because it is a, a very, very important topic. And just as you're discussing it, in Spain and in Europe, we continue to have a lot of discussions about reclaimed water, reclaimed wastewater reuse in agriculture. Okay, another time it will be. Thank you. <laughs> the, the first question is in that in the south of Spain, reclaimed water is frequently used for irrigation in agriculture, including leafy greens, eating raw. However, in other member states, the use of reclaimed water for leafy greens, eating raw if not a lobby. Do you think this is a, a too conservative mission? Well, I, I think, you know, I recognize with all of the time that, that I've been involved in water reuse and reclaimed uh, water process um, assessments for agriculture and for application to the environment that, you know, we, we have to appreciate it becomes a very sensitive issue for many people and you know there's sort of what, what we call the ug factor uh people don't like the idea of human wastewater being used uh and contacting their food or their recreational areas but it it is an extraordinarily valuable resource particularly in areas where we have water limitations california certainly shares that uh with with both your country and a variety of other arid regions so I, you know, I think that it, it, it is too conservative from the standpoint of people don't um, take the time to, you know, appreciate, you know, the controls and the safety that can be applied uh, to the water reclamation. And you can easily have water of much better quality in terms of safety than many of our surface water and even groundwater sources. So, you know, there, there are different ways that to do it to reduce people's concerns, which largely revolve around either the remnants or the residues that remain in the water, or even more so the use of hyperchlorination and the formation of disinfection byproducts. So there, there are other systems to deal with that. They just have a cost. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, which are the, the major microbiological risks associated to the use of reclaimed water as agricultural water? Are all of them equally important? Well, again, it's it's always difficult to answer those questions with a simple, you know, simple, straightforward manner because it, it is so dependent on the level of treatment, the quality of the treatment to, you know, to basically recondition the water for different uses in the in the environment or in agriculture. So in general, we we you know feel the primary concerns that remain after standard treatment might be uh, enteric viruses or human viruses and some of the parasites. Um, you know, in general, the bacterial biologic as a biological risk to humans is dealt with very effectively. Um, so it depends on the level of, of treatment and of course the engineering controls and process controls. We tend in California because of our regulations, we don't really feel that there are significant biological hazards. There are some remaining um, hazards with other constituents, at least from a perception standpoint. Okay, um, in, your, in your opinion, 
Is it usually possible to determine the origin of a foodborne outbreak associated to fresh produce, or is it undervalued? Um, let's see if, if I caught the, the question. I don't think that there is very good evidence that you know outbreaks with leafy greens in areas that are using tertiary treated wastewater or reconditioned water, you know, are, are you know, have occurred. Um, there are a number of cases where, you know, outbreaks or, or, or sort of chronic community illness are associated with incompletely treated wastewater applied to agricultural fields um, in, you know, in other areas outside of California or outside of the, the United States. Um, and you know there are a number of studies that you know have identified that i'm not sure if that answered your question completely or not mm -hmm. and, uh, currently in the eu there is a proposal to elaborate the first european legislation focused on the development of minimum quality requirements for water reuse in agricultural irrigation uh, there is special attention has been given to protozoa and potential indicators that might be used for the validation of the disinfection treatment in pro on protozoa. Particularly, they have included Clostridium prefringens spores as an indicator for protozoa. Which is your opinion about the use of Clostridium prefringens spores as an indicator for protozoa? Well, again, I, my understanding is not my specific area of research, but having been involved with many of the uh, review panels and initiatives, you know, within California and, and, you know, reasonable understanding of the literature that Clostridium perfringens is still the recognized um, surrogate or index organism for inactivation. There are, of course, some challenges uh, with that as far as predicting inactivation of protozoa because you really have to go through a viability assessment to know that that the you know treatments you know are in fact effective uh, at, at killing the parasites as well and they're still remain very very expensive um, so they still use clostridium prevengens as you know the primary index organism, but there are a number of studies that have shown that some of the other polyomaviruses and human-specific Bacteroidetes markers can also be very um, effective for demonstrating, you know, inactivation of parasitosis. And do you think that it will be enough with other, other microorganisms like viruses and not is necessary to make the thing with protozoa? Uh, no, <laughs> it, it, again, it so much of your um, ability to, to validate and then verify, you know, different treatments and inactivation of those, you know, those pathogens in a wastewater stream, um, you know, are going to depend on having individual index organisms or individual, you know, markers, you know, for effectiveness of your process controls for the different organisms. Again, you know, for bacterial organisms, it's reasonably straightforward. Um, the, one of the reasons that they use Clostridium perfringens is that a number of studies have shown that the consistency of their presence in terms of the, you know, the population density at the start of treatment is pretty, pretty uniform uh, across the water. So you can depend on showing, you know, a certain log reduction associated with specific treatments that that then would predict, you know, if you've done that, then you would have also inactivated enteric viruses or different parasites. But of course, their populations are some quite a bit more variable depending on where you are and especially what country you're in. So there's not one index organism that is perfect for everything. And, and also depends on, on the treatments that you're using. So many of them, you know, the, some of them are, they're more costly, but they have, you know, hyperfiltration systems and, you know, different things like that, that would actually be very effective at pulling out the parasites before you got to the final treatment, like with, you know, UV light. 
The, the only um, concern probably regarding the use of clostridium perfume spores as an indicator is that in, in some papers they have indicated that this is quite conservative. So probably you need to apply a lot of energy, so a very strong disinfection treatment to really reduce five or six logs of the clostridium perfume spores. While probably the parasites will not be so re, uh, strong to eliminate in some cases, some people may may think that even though even looking for the parasites by themselves is probably more interesting than just using something which is really hard to eliminate, like in the case of the spores of Clostridium perfringens. Is the, do you think that this can be a feasible alternative to use directly the parasites and see if we can reduce considerably in a in a good number when we are reducing a, a treatment? Yeah, well, I think that there, that the short answer is is yes, and I know that there's quite a bit of work going on, you know, to try and accomplish that for ex exactly the reason that you outlined is that that you know, inactivating the Clostridium spores is more conservative than many of the others. The challenge has always been to you know to be able to to understand and and demonstrate inactivation of viability of the parasitic spores. And I think there are some, you know, newer genetic tools coming along, which will greatly facilitate that um, based on, on, you know, different targets that have been, you know, challenged. So some of the other viruses, uh, you know, inactivation of those viruses, which can be bioassayed in a cell line, are also seem to be aligning with then the inactivation of the parasites and would be, you know, not so, you know, not require so much, you know, as, as you said, high energy costs to to accomplish that. But I think that that at least our regulatory structure hasn't accepted them just yet. But but that research is certainly going on, and and looks like that's the way that it'll go in the future. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, about disinfectant disinfectant system. Which are the most commonly um, uh, used uh, disinfection treatments for reclaimed water in California? Again, you know, the, it so much depends on the end use. Uh, chlorine remains the the primary treatment. Uh, you know, at the at the final step for for disinfection, after all of the other process controls uh, have been put in place, for most of the applications that would be going on and be land applied, whether it's, um, you know, environmental uses or groundwater recharge, um, they might even not do that level or, you know, certainly for agricultural irrigation in, in our area for a variety of things from, you know, leafy greens to strawberries to, you know, different cold season crops. Um, if it's going to, you know, be more direct consumer use, then a combination of UV and ozone treatment, uh, my understanding is most of the newer facilities have incorporated that above and beyond um, chlorination or as a substitute because they're, you know, in order to sell the use really to, to people, they, they minimize how much chlorine they're, they're applying. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. And other question, uh, one of the major points of the new proposal legislation is that uh, they request to develop a quantitative microbial risk assessment to determine the potential risk on public health. Do you think this approach will help to improve uh, food safety? Uh, do you think that RQMRA is needed for the establishment of any water reuse project? This is a great question, um, and that certainly, you know, my my perspective is that there is such a, a an extensive foundation of knowledge and research uh, for systems, you know, like this that have been done over, over many many years that uh, you can draw upon that. You would think to you know help assure people, give them the confidence once you can demonstrate, you know, appropriate engineering controls are in place, process controls are in place, sort of redundant monitoring systems are in place. However, with that said, one of the biggest challenges we have here, and I assume it would be, you know, the same or even perhaps stronger <laughs> in, uh, 
in the EU is, you know, to win people's confidence. And I think there's a, a level at which, you know, having specific data, having specific systems applied to, a, you know, quantitative microbial risk assessment, as well as toxicology and, you know, especially demonstration of the, the you know, the minimal or negligible impact of different pharmaceuticals, personal care products that aren't, you know, as readily eliminated uh, is, is really just necessary to, to win uh, public support. And that, that is actually a very big part of, of what's going on here in California as we expand our water reuse and water reclamation uh, initiatives. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And uh, the, the last question, uh, is there any concern in California uh, regarding the, the accumulation of disinfection and byproducts in the reclaimed water? Absolutely. <laughs> That's one of the one of the areas of what we would say pushback uh, where, you know, local um, communities are trying to establish a, a water reuse plan and get raise money through government bonds, through, you know, taxes, whatever it may be to build these facilities, operate the facilities because of our sort of long term uh, water shortages and, and, and efficiencies. So, you know, there, those things um, become, you know, very you know, very important factors in both the decisions as to what kinds of treatments are, are going to be done, what kind of information um, and, and public education, public um, outreach effort uh, goes on to, you know, to get these things, you know, built and, and running. Uh, you know, there are many groups that use that to drive a wedge between uh, the initiatives to install and develop systems of different different quality and and raise the money to pay for it is you know I, you know the reasonably you know I think legitimate concerns around uh, the accumulation of disinfection byproducts uh, particularly in the watersheds sensitive coastal areas uh, and of course exposure to humans so it's not something to dismiss. Okay, and about the people, uh, which is, in, in your opinion, the, the people perception in, in California regarding the use of reclaimed water as agricultural water? The, uh, sorry, just make sure I understood the question. The, the key yeah. concerns or perceptions? Uh, the, the people perception in California about the use of reclaimed water is good or bad? <laughs> Again, like almost any one of these topics, you know, you have the full range of uh, people that recognize that, that water is a, one of our most precious uh, renewable commodities. And, you know, we don't get enough in general. We don't get enough through, through rainfall. Uh, people, and certainly in, in California, the agricultural production in some areas have greatly depleted our, our aquifers, and that causes tremendous issues um, and not uh, including water quality. So you have supporters, but you have sort of the absolute detractors. It doesn't matter what you tell them. It doesn't matter what you share. You know, they're going to be against it regardless. Um, so, you know, the, there's there has been building uh, broader support in many, many different communities that, that have over the last, you know, really 10 years and then five years started to use a lot more reclaimed wastewater for different purposes, including um, some areas where, you know, they're trying to win support for, you know, using that to create uh, drinking water. Um, but it takes a lot of effort. So in general, if you, if you tell people up front, you know, most people will be against it. And then it's a, it's a it takes time to, to win that community support, but it's becoming more, uh, it's become easier and easier over the last several years as we've, you know, had such an extended period of drought until last year we had, or this year we had, you know, tremendous rainfall, but now they're predicting another couple of years of, of reduced rainfall and drought. So we have to have the water come from someplace. They don't want to build dams to, to capture that and, you know, all of that. So more, more community support, I think, is... Um, becoming obvious, but you still have 
those that are just vocal and at every public hearing and dead set against wastewater reuse. Okay, thank you very much for your time. It was a very interesting interview for us, and we would like to, to see you as soon as possible in, in Murcia. I, I invite well, you. Well, that would be um, that would be wonderful. I, I've enjoyed going there before, and I'd love to come back. And of course, you guys have a tremendous, you know, scientific uh, community there as well, working on all of these issues on behalf of of your country and you know all the rest of us. So it was my pleasure to, to, to help try and help out this morning. Okay, the, the pleasure is ours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Trevor. So